Welcome to Dark Dreams. The moon is full and it is dripping with blood. Now comes Blood Moon Rising magazine. Original fiction. Creature features. Nightmarish artwork. Interviews and other original horror. Visit BloodMoonRisingMagazine.com and join our Rising Legion. The Battered Wife by Graham Masterton Halfway through the afternoon it began to rain, almost laughably hard, and they retreated under the canvas awning of the bric-a-brac stall. You should leave him, said Sylvia, over the syncopated drumming of the rain. You should pack everything up, take the kids, and walk out. You could always come to Tunbridge Wells and stay with us until you find somewhere else to go. How can I, said Lily, and why should I? Poppy's only just started at Elm Trees. She'd be so upset if we had to move, and Jamie keeps wetting the bed as it is. Apart from that, damn it, Sylvia, half of that house belongs to me and I've spent three years decorating it exactly the way I want it. But you can't go on the way you are, Lily. One day he's going to kill you. Lily didn't know what to say. She knew that Sylvia was right. It was a gloomy, wet afternoon in late September, but she was wearing dark glasses to conceal her two bruised eyes. Two nights ago, Stephen had come home in one of his moods. He had been drinking although he wasn't incoherently drunk, like he sometimes was. She had cooked him a chicken and tomato casserole, one of his favorites, but for some arcane reason he had interpreted this as mockery. What? You think I'm some kind of a peasant? All I ever want to eat is chicken and tomato casserole? He had dropped the Le Crusette casserole on the kitchen floor, cracking the tiles and splashing her ankles with scalding red sauce, and then he had punched her once on the bridge of the nose. Me, I would have called the police, said Sylvia. Oh, yes, and then Stephen would tell them that he's suffering from stress at work, and how sorry he is, and how he'll never ever lay another finger on me. At least see a counselor, Lily, please. Lightning crackled behind the horse chestnuts that bordered the village green, followed by an indigestive grumble of thunder. Children scurried in the rain between the tents, screaming. Sylvia said, Why does it always rain whenever we hold a feat? You would have thought that God was all in favor of us raising money for a donkey sanctuary. His son went everywhere by donkey. But Lily wasn't really listening. She was frowning at a woman who was sheltering under the cake stall opposite. The woman was wearing a gray knitted hat and a gray three-quarter length raincoat, and she had a pale, drained face with tightly pursed lips. She had a small gray Bedlington terrier with her, which repeatedly shook itself. What Lily found unsettling was the way the woman was staring at her, unblinking. She turned her head away for a few seconds, but when she looked back, the woman was still staring at her. "'Do you see that woman?' she asked Sylvia. "'What woman?' "'That woman. The one in the gray raincoat with the dog, next to the cake stall. "'What about her?' "'She's staring at me. She's been staring at me for the past few minutes.' Sylvia pulled a face. "'Perhaps she knows you.' Well, I certainly don't know her, and look, she's still staring at me. There was another rumble of thunder, but it was much further away now, and the rain was easing off. After a few minutes, Lily and Sylvia stepped out from under the awning, and soon the aisles between the tents were crowded again. Lily tried to see if the woman in the gray hat and the gray raincoat was still standing at the cake stall, but she had vanished. Before she picked up Poppy from Elm Trees, Lily parked on a double yellow line in the high street to buy pork chops and runner beans and a fresh loaf of bread. She went into the off-license, too, and bought two bottles of Merlot on special offer. 
Stephen usually drank Merlot, and she thought that if she showed him that she didn't disapprove of his drinking so long as he did it in moderation, he might not feel that she was judging him too so much. You're always judging me just because you're a solicitor's daughter. Who the hell do you think you are? She was waiting at the counter in the off-license when she turned toward the window to make sure that there were no traffic wardens around. Standing outside the window, peering in at her, was the woman in the gray hat and the gray raincoat, with her Bedlington terrier beside her. Lily was about to go outside and ask her what she wanted when the assistant took her bottles of Merlot from her and said, "'Afternoon, madame. Like to put your card in?' By the time she had paid and stepped out of the off-license, the woman had gone. She looked up and down the high street, but there was no sign of her. She put Poppy and Jamie to bed early that evening and read them a story. Criss-crossed in Snappyland, about a boy who kept losing his temper until he was taken away by monsters, who could all shout much louder than he could. "'Mummy,' said Poppy, as Lily tucked her in, "'we're not going to go away, are we?' Of course not, sweetie. But Daddy is always shouting and makes you cry. I don't like it when he shouts and makes you cry. Daddy has a lot of worry at work. Sometimes it makes him cross, like crisscross in Snappy Land. He doesn't really mean it. I heard you tell Daddy that you were going to take us away. Well, that's because I get cross, too. But I don't mean it, either. That lady said you mustn't take us away. Lady? What lady? She was standing outside the playground today, and she called me. She said, Poppy. Then she said, Your mummy mustn't leave your daddy. Lily stared at her. What did this lady look like? She had a gray woolly hat and a gray raincoat, and she had a dog that looked like a dirty lamb. And that was all she said? She didn't tell you what her name was, or how she knew what your name was? Poppy shook her head. The bell went, and I had to go inside. Stephen still hadn't come home by 10.15. Lily stood in the living room with a glass of Merlot in her hand, almost motionless, looking at herself in the mirror over the mantelpiece, as if she were someone that she didn't recognize. A 35-year-old woman with blonde, short-cropped hair, and two black eyes that were now turning rainbow-colored, as if she were wearing a Peretz mask. She didn't know whether to start supper or not. It was so late now that she herself had lost her appetite, and she didn't know what state Stephen would be in when he eventually arrived home. She was still standing in front of the mirror when the doorbell chimed. She went into the hallway to answer it. Through the green and yellow stained glass window in the front door, she could see a dark, distorted shape. "'Who is it?' she called out. There was a moment's pause, but then a woman's voice said, Don't open the door. There's no need to. But don't take the children away. What? she demanded. Who are you? She unfastened the latch and threw the door open wide. In the porch stood the woman in the gray hat and the gray raincoat, her face as gray as newspaper. As soon as she saw Lily, she screamed out, Don't take the children away. Not tonight. Something terrible will happen if you do. Terrified, Lily slammed the door shut. After she had done so, she stood in the hallway, quaking. From upstairs, she heard Poppy calling out, Mummy! Mummy! Jamie's wet the bed! She approached the front door again. The light in the porch was shining through the stained glass window, but she couldn't see the shape of the woman any more. She slid the security chain into place, and then she opened the door a little way. The woman had disappeared. All she could see were street lights flickering through the trees, and all she could hear was the muffled sound of traffic. She switched off the lights in the living room, and she was just about to go upstairs to run a bath when the front door burst open with a deafening crash. Lily! Lily! Where the F are you? She went through to the hallway. Stephen was leaning against the open door, his hair sticking up like a schoolboy's, his tie crooked. She could smell alcohol and regurgitated curry. Stephen, she said. Oh, you recognize me. You know who I am. That makes a change. He took three stumbling steps forward, lost his balance, and almost collided with her. Get away from me, she told him. Get away from you? That's not what you said on our wedding night, you bitch. Stephen, you're drunk and you stink. 
Go upstairs and take a shower and go to bed. Stephen stood in the hallway, swaying. He had a faraway look in his eyes, and he was smiling. Stephen, she repeated, and it was then that he slapped her so hard that she bounced against the wall, knocking her head and jarring her shoulder. She fell to the floor, but Stephen gripped the front of her dress, tearing it wide open. He dragged her under her feet and slapped her again and again. You know what you are? He kept yelling at her. You know what you are? Both Poppy and Jamie were crying as she bundled them into the Mariva. She heaved the big blue traveling bag into the back and slammed the door. As she climbed into the driver's seat, Stephen reappeared on the porch. Lily! he shrieked at her. You're not taking my kids, Lily. You're not going anywhere, you bitch. He staggered down the front steps towards them. Lily turned the key in the ignition and revved the engine. Poppy was screaming now, and Jamie was crying in a high, panicky whistle. Stephen banged his fist on the Mariva's rear window, and Lily put her foot down so that it hurtled out of the driveway in a spray of pea shingle. There was a deep, clumsy thump, and Lily saw a body tumbling in the air in front of her. It turned over and over before it hit the road, but immediately another car ran over it, and its arms flew up and its hands clapped together, smack, as if it were applauding. Shaking with shock, Lily climbed out of the driver's seat and stepped out into the road. The woman in the gray woolly hat and the gray raincoat was lying on her back, staring up at her blind-eyed. Lily turned around. A small crowd had already gathered, and the driver of the second car was phoning for an ambulance. Standing next to her front gate, however, was the same woman, in her gray hat and her gray raincoat, with her Bedlington Terrier on its lead. Lily walked across to her. The woman's image appeared to ripple, as if she were seeing her through running water. "'You're dead,' Lily whispered. "'That's you, lying in the road. You're dead!' I did try to warn you, Lily, the woman told her. You should have walked out over a year ago, when he first started to hit you. But you were too frightened of being on your own, and secretly you enjoy being his victim, don't you? It makes you feel wanted. You should have stayed, because now look what you've done. Lily said, I'm so sorry. But the woman turned around and walked away, leaving her dog standing on the pavement. As she turned the corner and disappeared from sight, Lily called out, I'm so, so sorry. I say every house in America should have an electric chair. And every man just once in his life should sit in it, just so that he can feel the power of millions of gallons of electricity flow through his veins. I got an electric chair, that's all I need. You get an electric chair, Sheldon, you don't have to worry about the audience. You get an electric chair, you can tell them anything you want. As long as it's real. You get yourself an electric chair and I'll sit there all night long. Kind of a funny idea, sitting in an electric chair and doing a show. Well, think of the therapeutic value of an electric chair. And all the money it is. Yes, sir. Uh, an electric chair in every home. The Electric Chair. A show about horror. Electricchairshow.com. An electric chair. Wow. Doll Attic. By Jonathan D. Pino. You can find what's left of my chances tied in ribbon amidst the dust of tomes and fairy tales arranged neatly on ornate shelves, whitewashed and riddled with harlequins, staring out into the bay from the loft. They seek out ships with their buttons, and sink them with the tears on their lips, mourning the traffic of the inlet as they mimic what's merely been imbued painted by unfortunate sorts that are sad enough to cherish them in the first place. That someone is what remains of myself, a woman who could tell you of her books. Some are sorted by feeling, others by circumstance or meaning, each one a token of sentiment to what's forgotten at the top of the world. My kingdom is the confine of this spire, 
a lookout from the loneliness above their slanted and aching attempts to level what can't ever be evened. It's my slice of what it's all worth, a corner with a window to its end, and a perspective of that jump toward the ground, a throne for the inanimate and artificial. At heart, or perhaps only in name, how I wallow in the potential certainty of my freedom that could come from a hasty fall, from the task and painful memories that's built this sanctuary toward an impartial sky. I'd squander it all in a second, if it meant to be removed from that tryst. But I'd never be able to leave. The tower is just too high, the stories within much too sacred. I'm afraid that their ink is permanent, no matter how I burn the pages. And sometimes the dolls just comfort me. Yet at others, they write the whole tale. I can tell you that it started in a bedroom just below my skyward refuge, in linens and defiance of a father that's done anything but question the inside. To him, it was a game of fronts, wondering about the outside's perception instead of believing in the impulse of the soul. It began just as sex and rebellion, as a way to embellish my youth while the moment still spoke to its exploits. He was a seaman, from the nearby port, a working bloke with only labor to his name. I never fancied an interest in money, nor did I seek out his face for glory. It was merely an exploration of feeling, the kind you get when you're twenty, and impassioned by the stories they feed you in homeschool, the literature that defies the odds. You've been locked away for the better part of a decade, and the only way you could know you exist is by wishing that you were a part of that sea that roared so unruly near rocks, the shores being drowned in its rage, stubborn but prone to erosion, much like will of a youngster. I couldn't just say no to the tides. I had to swim in them instead of pass them by. Off the lifeboat that sheltered me helplessly, from what my existence craved most in earnest. We met on a brisk autumn evening, just as the sun had receded and my parents retired to the study. From the top floor I crept into the corridor and down the stairs that led into the foyer. My mother was chattering so feverishly that she didn't notice the faintest footsteps, distracting my father in the process as I left the main entrance ajar. From the path it was a twenty-minute walk until I reached the edge of the port, wandering into the bustling pub with the fear of the unknown in my gut. It was near the entrance he spotted me, glancing over from his seat at the bar. I hung my coat on the rack and paced nervously toward a spot he'd been saving. You look better from this side of the window, he sipped from the edge of his glass. I didn't think you'd recognize me so close. I thought maybe my descriptions would help. You've been reading the letters I sent you. He gazed at me in the flickering firelight, the iron lamps dangling just above our heads and illuminating the tavern's interior in a rugged but entrancing glow. I watched him go to his pocket and pull out a collection of envelopes, bent from exposure to the elements, most likely his ventures offshore. He hesitated as he spoke. You know, I'm not... I'm not as experienced as some of these guys would have you believe. Never seen a woman so beautiful. Not just outside, but on the inside as well. These letters, they remind me of glass. So well crafted and fragile to the touch. Complex in the way that it's made. Not just how it could break. I felt my heart flutter in my chest. Like porcelain? Yeah, just like porcelain. I savored the melody of his brogue. You know, I didn't think we'd ever meet. You sending them letters to me through the servants was a real clever idea. I bought you... I, I brought you something. He reached into a bag on the floor, pulling up the most beautiful of ornaments. A doll made from the finest china, foreign and exquisitely detailed. 
My mouth hung open in surprise. How could he have possibly known? I see that attic of yours through the pair of binoculars, too. You've been building them dolls for a while. I, I figured you may like an exotic one. He wasn't just a handsome face waving at me from a boat off the coast, looking for my light in the window to acknowledge that I was thinking of him, too, well into the darkest night. This wasn't a wayward signal or desperate cry from beyond the divide of our worlds. It was a truth, a pleasant here and now, a warm embrace that was forged in trust over years of wondering who each other was. I wanted you to know that those letters, I could only write in the faith that you would respond. I knew that you would if I did. I knew that I could if you accepted them. Ellie, I was waiting to accept them, each time I pulled into port. I remember him carrying me home, in his arms and the security of his kiss. We found our way into the bedroom, upstairs, and in spite of my family, with all love in the world in our midst, our bodies an extension of its bliss. He worshipped me and made me whole, young and inexperienced as he was, as I was in the reflection of his eyes. It was the rhythm of a thousand meanings converging into one defining moment through a lark that we both happened to entertain. But then the morning came. I heard the gift shatter as he opened my door in a fit. Out! I want him out! Right now! My father saw us wrapped in the sheets, still clinging to each other as the early sun washed over our skin. Out! He looked back as he gathered his clothes. You know, Ellie, just like porcelain. I never saw him again. I never fixed that figure on the floor. Instead, I just created a bunch of others, as I marched up into the void of that haven removed from where my happiness was made useless, and I a maiden betrothed to the clouds. Upstairs in the attic where I saw him, where he realized I was fragile like the dolls, perfect even in their destruction, frail at their innermost core. This time, I'm not thinking of the fall. I feel it as I force myself to slip, watching his vessel one last time as the loft glass vindicates me in jaggedness, cutting me from this shell of emptiness. Just before this toy... Hits the ground. Horrified Press. Horrified Press. Dot WordPress. Dot com. Hey all, thanks for checking back with me, your segment host, Nathan Jonathan David Lee Roick, Editor-in-Chief of Horrified Press. Boy, have we got a packed show for you this week, kids. No filler, all killer. That's right, second show down, and the law of diminishing returns is nowhere to be found. Lots to talk about, so I'm just going to jump right in. First, let's go to that social media tool we spend so much of our time scanning fastidiously, Facebook. Going to talk to you about a thread that came up on my newsfeed through one of our friends on the Horrified Press site. The post basically talks about a review received by a female writer. The reviewer in question basically expressed his displeasure at the character being female and over feisty. The post reads as follows. I got a comment about Coyote a while back. A guy said he was fed up with all these uber women and that maybe they served a purpose a while back, but it really didn't need that now. First, I'd like to clear up that Coyote isn't uber at all. She has a lot of weaknesses, but she is just confident and the best gunslinger. Those are her talents. But the comment made me raise my eyebrows. Why wouldn't we want them now? Why is it offensive if a woman is the big hero? I think 90% and probably more of the time it's a guy. So why would it be so offensive if, if once in a while it's a woman? We don't even see it with the guys anymore. That's just normal. I've heard comments like this before, and to be honest, it breaks my heart. 
Women are 50% of the population, and guess what? A lot of us like to identify with strong women too. We don't want to be James Bond's sweetheart. We want to be James Bond, but then the chick version. So that's what I write, because I want strong women, not uber women. Any uber character bores me. I also like writing about the underdog kicking ass. That is why Caesar, her partner, is a former slave in a time where it wasn't good to be a black guy. It saddens me that it matters what the gender is of the main character and that people will not be attracted to a story because it features a strong woman. It's a risk I knew I was taking. Same as using my own name on the book. I'm female and we are often associated with romance. I hope things will change though. There are some female writers who are making those first steps. Now, I'm going to actually just say the name of the person that made this comment. I um, hope I pronounce her name correctly. Um, the author in question is Chantal Nordelus, I think. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, and not an author in question at all. The points she raises are highly valid. And uh, I'm just going to read you um, some of the points, um, some of the replies that re she received. Um, because it's just interesting to me how... Um, she's absolutely right, you know, women make up 50% of the population, yet we still live in an age where they can't earn the same in certain jobs as a man doing the same role, etc, etc. Uh, it's totally wrong, totally um, unjustifiable. Uh, women can do everything that a man can do. Um, I think personally that women can do everything a man can do. However, I think women have strengths that us men don't. And I think us men have strengths that women don't. Um, so basically my opinion is that the playing field is level. However, I think women excel at certain things better than we do and we excel at other things. Um, for example, me and my partner, um, when it comes to doing anything around the house, she'll be the creative one with the ideas. I mean, I'm very creative myself, but in a different way. So she'll be creative with things like ideas, maybe colour schemes if we're painting something or whatever. And I'll be Mr. Practical getting the job done. It's not that she can't do the job. It's just, I think generally we're just better at just getting on with something. And women pick those details to make it nice. Um, but, you know, I mean, you might may say I'm being chauvinist there, but that's just what I see. Um, I'm going to read you some of the comments anyway. Um, it might be generally ingrained, a sort of survival mechanism that nowadays only serves to hurt people and much less do what it's supposed to, namely creating a solid social group. The familiar us against them we see in almost all aspects of society, be it sports, religion, the schools, playgrounds or what you have. I agree with you. Female characters are hard to write to even please other women, make her strong or fiercely defensive and someone will call her a bitch. I wrote a story where the woman tells her man what's what and someone called her a know-it-all. That's interesting, isn't it? I used to work in a video shop as a teen. I've had men literally tell me they didn't like movies with strong women in them and those films were often a lot less popular. Dear, oh dear. Um... I'm going to go out on a limb here and pretend like I'm an established writer, but in time you should begin to ignore 90% of the comments that are not constructive criticism. The interweb is such a manic melting pot of racism, sexism and overall pointlessness. I think you've got to leave uh, Grumpy Cat out of that, but okay, we'll go with that. If I listened to all the critics, I would have given up and retired to a cave long ago. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. I say, pay attention to the ones you please, not the ones you don't. I think that is very good advice. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if you listen to every negative comment or listen to you know individual negative comments, you would just hang up your pen or uh, you know just stop writing on your computer. That would be it. Um, I've had a few situations like that where I've had reviews of one star um, and telling me there was nothing good about anything about this story and then I've had other reviews saying that it was a masterpiece. Now I'm giving it like four or five stars out of five so it's kind of a bit weird how one person can view something one way and, and someone can view it a completely different way. Uh, horses for courses as they say. Um, Someone mentioned here, uh, well said, so sad there is still gender bias in the media. With video games, there is said, it's said that games with female protagonists don't sell well. 
But last year there was an uproar in the game industry about the position of women working in the game industry and the lack of strong female protagonists in games. There is awareness now, so maybe one day we don't have to prove over and over again our point. Now that is very interesting. There was an uproar in the gaming industry about what happened to Lara Croft in Tomb Raider. Attention ladies, apparently raping the hell out of us makes us stronger and more likeable. Ouch. You know, I'm just surprised women play games. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But isn't it interesting, like, um, you know, there are a lot of female game players out there that, that you know, feel that they're not being represented. Um, and you can take that in anything. You can take that in literature. You can take that in movies. Um, and it's really uncalled for. There's, there's absolutely no reason. Um, I actually mentioned during this thread in my comment about the film Aliens. Now, if Sigourney Weaver hadn't have played that part, if it hadn't have been a female role, can you imagine the fight at the end of that movie with the alien queen and the character Ripley without that kind of she's defending the little girl and the queen's defending the eggs, that kind of mothering instinct to fight to the death to protect the young? It just wouldn't have worked with a guy. I mean, yeah. So I find that kind of interesting. Um, but let me know what you think. Go onto the Horrified Press site and you will see a submissions email there. You can use that, it's my personal email, and uh, tell me what you think, and you can just head that up with um, podcast questions, um, some heading like that, just so that I know what it's about, and it's not a submission, and I don't think you want it in one of our books. Um, but yeah, very interesting. Anyway, on with the show. So that was Punkasilla with Copasos album Acronym Wars. Okay, so moving on. More on the uh, social horror um, side of things for this. Uh, <laughs> there's so much to talk about with this world that I despise. Um, but we're going to go into the world of fandom now. We're going to talk about my favourite show. And my favourite show, of course, is um, Anyone Knows Me. Doctor Who. It was one of those shows I watched from about the age of six years old and it really gave me an idea of fantasy. Um, it, it opened my mind to new concepts, to scientific concepts and I just found the show amazing and still do on and off. But anyway, Matt Smith was good though, I'll give him that. Now, big problem. Um, well, to me it's a big problem and to a lot of people I speak with in the UK it's a big problem. Other people I've spoken to don't see it as a big deal. It's just really, really annoyed me. What it is, basically, big event in America, biggest one, for shows to exhibit their new material, Comic Con. So they made a trailer for um, the special Doctor Who episode they're showing this year. For those that don't know, the show is 50 years old. And they're doing a, a big special, you know, film 3D 
episode um, to be transmitted on November 23rd, which was the original date that the first episode was transmitted on. So it's a it's a big year for Whovians, and yeah, you know, I'm I'm I wouldn't say I'm not like a super fan, you know. I, what have I got around my flat? I've got like a wind up Dalek and a couple of books, a few DVDs. I, you know, it's not like that, but I enjoy the show. I like to watch it if it's on. I will watch it, that sort of thing. So anyway, um, they showed this trailer at Comic Con, and they made it exclusive for Comic Con, which we were all like, fair enough, okay. Now, bear in mind, Comic Con is in America, and I'm I'm glad that the people that went to Comic Con got to see it. They paid, they deserve to see it. That's fine. Uh, also, they showed a just to mention the trailer for a origin story that they're doing for Doctor Who called an Adventure in uh, Space and Time as well. So anyway, basically, long story short, they haven't showed it to. Uh, the rest of the American audience or the worldwide audience and they certainly haven't shown it to the UK audience even after the event you know a few weeks after the event which we expected they would I think this is bang out of order reason being the BBC isn't a corporate channel the BBC is funded by British license payers mainly who pay uh, a government uh, enforced it's like another tax really called the license fee if you do not pay the license fee you can go to prison pay for the content for the BBC BBC is a channel in the UK that has no advertisements it has a charter which it has to follow so that it's representative of all the different peoples and different tastes in the UK and obviously they export shows abroad which is great and I'm glad that's fine about all of that. The problem is that they've made this trailer with content that we've paid for it mainly. And I know that there are other people around the world that have BBC services as part of their cable network. And they pay their cable operator. So, you know, a fraction of that money goes to the BBC. So I do understand that. But the thing is, I think beforehand or at least after the exclusive at Comic Con, because we've mainly paid for the making of the show and because the BBC is answerable due to the charter to us by law as well I think really they should show it to us and they're talking about not showing it at all and I just think it's out of order and I'm not a big fan of the new showrunner well I say new he's been there three years now Stephen Moffat not a big fan of him at all I think he opens up grossly epic storylines like I, I say grossly he, he grossly overblows the story to to think that you're getting a conclusion later which never comes it's sloppy writing uh, which i don't like um 50 50 of the shows now i like but that's not the point 50th anniversary gotta stay positive gotta stay optimistic he gets it half right in my opinion most of the time so that's all right and he brings on some big writers as well which who i love and their episodes are always good but yeah, so anyway, I complained to the BBC because I just think it sucks. And this is what they sent me back. Dear Mr. Roark, thank you for contacting us. I understand you were unhappy a trail for the 50th anniversary episode of Doctor Who was shown at Comic Con. Well, first of all, let me just interrupt there. I never said I was unhappy with it. I never said it was a problem. <laughs> you know, the BBC are funded by us, but... Whether they make a trailer or not is up to them. We don't have any say in the running of the corporation yeah, or the shows that they make. But if they make a trailer, we should eventually see it. Eventually. Yeah. Anyway, I'll give us this. This was an exclusive Comic Con trailer made especially for the Doctor Who 50th panel. And he has not been released in the US. This world-famous international event is an established platform used by all of the major producers. UK fans can look forward to exclusive content over the next few months. Nevertheless, I'd like to assure you that I've registered your concerns on our audience log. This is a daily report of audience feedback that's made available to many BBC staff, including members of the Doctor Who team, the BBC executive board and other senior managers. The audience logs are seen as an important document that can help shape decisions about future programmes and content thanks again for taking the time to get in touch kind regards blah blah now it doesn't really address anything I've just said is really my concerns I haven't got the original message which I sent them but it's pretty much what I've just told you beforehand this does nothing I mean we're gonna get what exclusive content over the next few months if this means like they're going to do things like um, show us like 
teaser trailers of two minutes and rather than what we've been explained happened at Comic Con because a lot of people basically the showrunner Stephen Moffat uh, decided to kind of almost threaten the audience by saying you know there'll be no more exclusive content ever if you show this on the internet or whatever afterwards you know because people film these things at the events now the thing is it's a bit of an empty threat because trailers basically aren't really made for uh, the audience to be happy you know trailers are made as an advertising tool okay we all know it so it's a bit of an empty threat anyway but you know he didn't say anything about anyone describing the trailer so people have, uh, that were at Comic Con have been very nice nice enough to explain to us fans what actually went on in the trailer and we want to see that you know what I'm saying but again you know I don't know what you think about that. And I don't just think us in the UK should see it as well. I think the whole the US audience around the world, the BBC audience, the big fans of Doctor Who should see it. Okay, because that exclusive, that's done. That was weeks ago now. You know, don't be arses. You've made the trailer. Just release it and let the fans see it because it's only going to encourage them more to watch the actual special, which is going to be uh, broadcast simultaneously around the world. So you'd think they'd really want to be pushing it anyway. So that was the double agents with I Want, Need, Love You. It's from the album Wild About You, Tales from the Australian Rock Underground, 1963 to 1968. <clears throat> Shuffle my papers like a real 
news reporter here. I've got some news from Horrified Press regarding a new release. It's a novel by a writer called Jason Gerlert. And it is absolutely brilliant. Basically, the book is called Contagion. And it's about a contagion in uh, South Africa. Without spoiling too much, a team of scientists are dispatched to deal with the problem. And it's it's a serious book. Actually, I'm going to read you the proper blurb now so you can get a sense of um, where we're going with this book. It's a genuinely frightening book it's very fast paced it's very well written i i i can't um i can't recommend this book highly enough to be honest with you i've read a lot of books in my time obviously i write reams and novels of my own work and i I've, re I've read well i must have edited well over 90 different authors through horrified press so i do have an idea and i'm telling you this book is fantastic also fans of old school horror you know that old school 80s horror you guys are gonna absolutely go crazy for this because this is what you missed you know this is what was left behind and it's got a lot of modern twists in it as well it's a, it's a great story when world-renowned dr quentin forsyth goes missing after traveling to a decimated colony in the heart of south africa a team of doctors must find a way to save one of their own when a sinister new virus is unleashed doctors judas sturgis and katie madison embark into the colony to find their missing colleague dr quentin forsyth it's a race against the clock when the u.s military led by captain nathaniel logan arrives on orders to quarantine the whole area a fractured rebel army arrives with their own dark agenda and dr sturgis starts to unravel from the seams can katie madison and captain logan hold everything together and find a way to save the colony or risk becoming her next victims horror fiction review calls it fast-paced reads like a cult classic Horrorworld.org says Gerlet has genuine storytelling ability. So, uh, buy it. It's out on the 26th of August from Horrified Press. Um, it's a re-release. Um, it was released previously. This is a new version. And it's a great book. And it's been updated. And I think you're just going to love this book. So make sure you join us for that one. So um, here's something interesting that actually happened to me this week. I received an email, basically, or a message on Facebook um, from an author asking me uh, whether or not I would consider reviewing their book. Now, usually, um, I don't get these messages, and if I do get these messages, if it's a horrified press author, then obviously I'll support them because they support us with their stories in our anthology books or their novels that they release with us so that's all well and good however um again a female author a very good female author um was so uh, pleasant and nice about it i was like yes of course i'll do it and i actually had some spare time that afternoon so that was really good um and i'll tell you all about her and tell you the review i left um, on goodreads for the book now um the book's called frozen um it's not released by horrified press um it's by Rachel Rachel Bronson um, I'll tell you what she's put up actually I'll, put, I'll tell you what the blurb is um, and it's available on Amazon on the frozen side of Mount Barmatia something is stalking the dreams of Dr Mackenzie Skillman and a team of scientists as they try to dissect and analyze a newly discovered breed of humanoid can they survive long enough to find its origins or will a strange psychic siege lead them all to their deaths um it was brilliant it was a really good book um it's it's a short length story it's 37 pages um so this is what I had to say about Frozen. So as editor-in-chief of Horrified Press, I like a good horror story. It can be as short as Frozen is, a novel, anything good then I'm in. Not having any sort of background on the author, I had no expectations before embarking on this literary trip into the Himalayas. I was very pleasantly surprised. Frozen takes elements from my all-time favourite stories and brings them to life in an original context and within an original setting. The characters were realistically drawn, and I 
found myself genuinely concerned for the fate of Rachel's protagonist and for the fate of us all. A well-written, thought-provoking tale of modern horror, highly recommended. And I absolutely stand by that. I'm not giving away too much there. I've read you her official blurb for the book so you can get an idea what it's about, but I don't want to divulge anything. The book, as I say, is for sale. It's for sale on Amazon. And um, check it out. Okay, people. I'm going to take you back to the manor. I'm talking about Hilltop Manor, available on lulu.com. Um, horrified press release, written by myself, this one. But yeah, I'm going to read you a page. So here we go. Just going to take my paper back, flick through it, and stop on a page. So here we are. I should just read what I find. Two burly characters wearing old-fashioned braces and bowler hats were shouldering a third figure between them, seemingly unconscious. Gail crept up to the grimy wall to see him in more detail. It was a brass-coated skeleton from what she could make out, covered with small mirrors along its arms and legs. The black and white image brought out its shine against the morning sun. Returning to the projector, she moved the footage on. One of the workers held up a card for the cameraman. Cadaver pod was written across the middle in big letters. The word sent chills down her spine. What did it mean? The scene changed to that of her father's workshop. It was situated toward the back of the house, secured shut by an old sliding panel and a padlock. Gail was inside it now, watching him stand a hideous statue inside a strange chalk circle scraped into the tiles. What had he been up to? Was he about to perform a ritual? He had a book in his hand, the one she had found in his study. It was the grimoire. Damn it. She'd left it upstairs. It must be ashes by now. A group of little shits started popping out of nowhere to climb the legs of the bolted skeleton in the centre of the room. They took their positions, making themselves comfortable, getting ready to perform. One even had its lips around a reed lodged inside the skull's mouth, waiting to speak. These weren't the Reminex Gale knew. They were too obedient, too servile. Her father wheeled the cadaver pod into the library, a flustered cinematographer in tow. Once set up, Samuel released a curtain around the skylight to flood the quarters with moonbeams. Slowly, the coated frame of the recently dead started to move, light flashing around its reflective arteries. Samuel appeared to speak to it, the Reminex responding. That's how they'd gotten inside the manor. Samuel had invited them on the promise of scientific recognition. They tricked him. Gail saw the footage was coming to an end. The feeding spool almost emptied. The film jumped to a close-up inspection of the lumbering grotesque, handing her father a drink. He'd wanted them for slaves. And there it was, a metal plate on one side of the unfortunate's hip. Reminex Limited, it said. That wasn't their name at all. They had been branded like cattle. Okay, so we'll leave it there. A little over a page there. If that sounds interesting to you, you can buy Hilltop Manor Girl Story on lulu.com from Horrified Press. You can also check out um, Red Skies Press, which released a book with three of my stories in it that link to Hilltop Manor, as in they're set in Hilltop Manor. Uh, they were three short stories and they've been put together under the title Carriage 13. So you can find out more about cadaver pods, a lot more about cadaver pods, and about previous occupants and other occupants of Hilltop Manor in Carriage 13, a novelette and that was released in an anthology, techno goth anthology by Red Skies Press and uh, the editor of these. Thank you.